The World Health Organization call it one of the world's priority neglected tropical diseases. Up to 138,000 people die every year from snake bites due to a drastic global shortage of antivenoms. I'm Joe Colan in Liverpool, maybe not the place you'd expect scientists to be working on a universal snake bite cure, but they hope their research will help 3 million people every year. Antivenom hasn't changed much since the early 1900s. Even the best only protect against a small number of the 250 different venomous snakes. We're trying to develop a completely new treatment for snake bite, effective against all of the snakes in sub-Saharan Africa and India. In sub-Saharan Africa, 32,000 people are dying from snake bite. In India, 46,000 people are dying from snake bite. That's half the number of people that are dying from HIV. And people are dying in Southeast Asia, they're dying in Latin America. Globally, there's 138,000 people dying from snake bite that we know of. To make antivenom, you need venom. And here at the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine, over 100 of the most venomous snakes on the planet are helping save lives. So I'm about to be only feet away from one of the world's deadliest snakes, which um, will be out of its box and writhing around free on the floor until our colleagues here secure it. So it is a little bit nerve-wracking, I have to say. All right. Yeah. yeah. Antivenoms are usually only effective against bites from the species of snake providing the venom. Right. Yeah. I might just try it like this. Got that. Okay. Just relax slightly. There we go. In and back out. Paul, I know it's been rare, but you have been bitten, is that right? It is, yes. Uh, I have been bitten by snakes in the past. Um, the last bite was some 17 years ago from an eight-week-old baby Western Diamondback rattlesnake. I had 26 ampules of antivenom, which is an, quite a large amount of antivenom. I spent several days in hospital with that, and the pain level was beyond anything I've experienced before. I felt like uh, somebody had was uh, sticking my arm into boiling oil and grinding my bones together. Currently, antivenom is made by extracting venom from a snake. A horse is then injected with very tiny doses of venom that does not cause harm to the horse. This stimulates the horse's immune response to make antibodies to the venom. These antibodies are then harvested from the horse's blood. In order to get a high enough concentration of antibodies, horses must be injected several times a year over several years. It's a long and expensive process, not easily available in the parts of the world that need it most. Africa is in an, in an antivenom crisis and has been for the last 20 years. And the reason is that the two best antivenoms that were available in Africa um, for most of the 70s and 80s and 90s have disappeared because they were expensive. The demand for those by governments and so on was really low. And those companies, one in Germany and one in France, simply could no longer afford to, to continue produ producing these, these loss makers. And so they stopped production. And what happened then was antivenoms that were less effective were coming in from other parts of the world and being used. And here now we have a problem because an effective product has been stopped. The supply of effective problem has stopped, replaced by other products which are some dangerously ineffective. But the doctors who are giving the antivenoms don't know that. How, how can they know that? And so they will give one vial of an antivenom, and if the patient doesn't recover, they will give more vials, more vials. 
and of so a watch product your... that's in ineffective. Yes, yeah, and that it's causing these adverse effects. Everything changed for Professor Rob Harrison when he got a call from the International AIDS Vaccine Initiative in San Diego. The telephone call was, do you want to collaborate with us? And my immediate reaction... Not on HIV, but on snake well, exactly, bite. that was my reaction. Why, why, why HIV? And he, was, he explained very quickly um, was that they had technical platforms that they had developed for their HIV vaccine research that he thought we could use very usefully for snake bite. Up until now, treatment has been based on the venom, not on the symptoms it causes, which include paralysis, asphyxiation, and unstoppable bleeding and bleeding in the brain. So the people who've been working on AIDS have understood more about the molecules and more about the antibodies and how they can work to interact broadly with HIV viruses, despite them changing a lot over time. The HIV researchers found that some humans develop broadly neutralising antibodies that prevent infection by the majority of HIV strains. Remarkably, these antibodies have found parts of the virus protein that are common among the many different strains. Such antibodies are therefore capable of inhibiting infection by any virus that has that region in common. In some cases, this translates to almost 90% inhibition of diverse HIV strains by a single antibody. What we're hoping to be able to do is to engineer antibodies so that they can broadly recognise lots of these different toxins, no matter which snake bites a person, and so they can be neutralised in a generic manner. It's hoped the new universal antivenom will require lower doses and will not produce the adverse reactions that antibodies from animals can cause. Certainly we wouldn't need to take venom and inject it into an animal in the way that snake bite therapies are made today. We'd be able to, to grow cells that produce the antibodies in the laboratory and remove the animals from the, from the process. Developing a universal antivenom has been made possible due to almost $12 million from the UK Department for International Development. Now, the World Health Organization identified 2030 as the date by which they'd like to halve snake bite deaths around the world. How optimistic can we be? I think if there is more investment like the Wellcome Trust, if there are more groups getting involved delivering the, the, the many different things that the, the WHO strategy involves, then we have a chance. But I do think it's ambitious. Um, but what I, I don't doubt is that there are groups around the world who have that commitment and who will try their very best to deliver.